Hi everybody, I'm Zilla Blitz and welcome. Today we're going to be taking a look at some gameplay from Fire on the Mountain, the newly released war game from Legion War Games covering the Battle of South Mountain from the Civil War. Now this was a one day engagement that happened on September 14th, 1862. And we're going to pick up the action at the 3 p.m. turn. We'll get a chance to see how gameplay flows, how combat works and how movement works to give you a sense of whether this might be a game you would enjoy picking up. One important side note about this video, I would look at this video as a way to get a sense for the gameplay, but since the rules have come out, there's been a number of questions about asking for clarifications on certain things. And while the rules I think are very clear in most places, there's a number of places where they don't quite seem to cover all the situations and cases that I'm running to in the battlefield. So I'm kind of filling in the blanks in some places. And what that means is as clarifications come out and as the designer and the developer make additions to the rules and make notes to the rules, I think some of the ways I might be playing might change. Additionally, there's been an issue with the order of battle that I know the developer and the designer are working on a fix on, and that might impact some of the rules for gameplay going forward. So I look at this more as a sense for capturing the flow and broader picture of how gameplay works, rather than looking at it as trying to pick up the nuances of gameplay as you're trying to learn the game. With that in mind, let's jump in and do a little bit of an overview, and then we're going to pick up the action at 3 p.m. on September 14th. Here's an overview of the entire battlefield as it stands right now at 3 p.m. Let's orient ourselves to the battle, talk about what's happened so far, and get ready to kind of take a look at this 3 p.m. turn. Now, each turn is about an hour. The battle starts early in the morning, and it goes late until a couple hours into after nightfall. Now, a point of orientation, north is to the right of the screen as you look at, so as you look at it. So east is to the bottom of the screen, and west is to the top of the screen. Union forces are in the blue and the dark blue, and they've been pouring in from the bottom of the screen here as we look at it, so the east side of the map. Confederate forces started out the day holding our two points of contention, which we'll talk about momentarily. They're coming in, their reinforcements are pouring in from the top of the screen, which is the western part of the map. And one cool thing about this battle is that it starts out kind of small. You don't have many units on the board, there's not many forces on the board, and then over the course of the day, reinforcements kind of pour in from both sides, and the intensity and the size and the scale of the battle picks up as the day goes, day goes along. Both sides are going to have their final batch of reinforcements come in at this 3 p.m. hour. And at this point in time, the battle will reach its kind of peak intensity with all of the combatants on the board. So what's this battle about? Well, it's battle over control of two gaps. The northern forces are trying to break through these gaps to get access to Lee's forces uh, behind these gaps to the west of these gaps. And... Confederate forces are trying to prevent that. And we can see, I'll outline here, there's Fox's Gap, which lies kind of to the left side of the screen, and then Turner's Gap, which lies kind of in the middle top of the screen. These are the two kind of key objectives that both sides are fighting for. And the victory of the game is kind of based on this. If either side controls both of these hexes at the end of the game, they win the battle outright. And by control, that means you have to have a unit in that hex. If that's not the case, so if the Confederate forces hold one victory, one location, and the Union forces hold the other location, then we go to victory points to determine who's going to win the, the battle. Now, I'll talk a little bit about victory points as we go along, but right now the victory point total is two points apiece. And we'll talk about why in a little bit. So, what we've got so far, though, how this history, how this battle has kind of enveloped, kind of unfolded over the course of the day, Confederate forces held Fox's Gap and they held Turner's Gap at the beginning. Northern forces, the Union forces, got pretty lucky in their initial assaults on Fox's Gap. And as we can see, they've pushed the Confederate forces well off that gap, back into the hills and woods, kind of to the north, northwest, if you would, of Fox's Gap. So they've got a pretty good control of Fox's Gap right now. And the big battle here is right around Turner's Gap. The northern forces, as we can see, kind of a wedge of northern forces here, have reached basically the gap, but they're going uphill. We can see that lighter terrain right around the gap there. And the Confederate forces have been holding this ridge line very well under fierce attacks. And that's where we're being right now at three o'clock. The good thing, the hopeful thing for the Confederate forces is that initially they're heavily outnumbered, but now they're getting some reinforcements that we can see pouring in behind the lines 
that they're going to be able to bring up to bear on the battlefield. So there's a lot going on as we start this 3 p.m. turn. We're going to dig in now and start with the rally phase. We'll talk a little bit about the sequence of play, we'll get the rally phase. Let's get closer into the action so we get a better detail of what's going on and let's get this turn moving. As we zoom in here on the action around Fox's Gap, and we can take a look just a little bit here to the north where we can see a much more contentious fight going over Turner's Gap, which sits right here under General Hill. Let's talk a little bit about the sequence of play and what we're gonna to try to do with the Union turn. So the sequence of play, each turn is broken down basically into four components for most of the turn. There's a rally phase, which we'll do first, then the Union forces are going to move, rally phase for Union forces. Then there's a movement phase, a reinforcement phase, then we're going to do combat, and then we're going to do that same four steps for the Confederate forces. So my thinking as the Union forces right now are kind of, we've got a few things to deal with. Let's take a look first over here back at Fox's Gap and see what's going on. First of all, we can see here that the Confederate forces are relatively weak in this area and they've been pushed back well away from Fox's Gap, which is out here. We've got some infantry up here, a rather strong contingent of, art well, infantry and artillery that's holding this line here, trying to push this artillery off the hilltop. We've got some more um, artillery and then Nagel's infantry down here um, holding that. So we're in fairly good shape. However, just to the west, we'll notice that there's a large number of Confederate reinforcements here that are in column formation and they're moving down this road here. Now it's clear what they want to try to do, just going to move up here, try to cumber Lambert's clearing here, and then push back up in here. So we as the Northern forces have to figure out some kind of an answer for that. Fortunately, the Northern forces have some reinforcements arriving here that have just reached Fox at Fox's Gap. So for this area of the map, for the Fox's map Gap area of the map, my thinking is to consolidate a line right around here, just to the east of Lambert's Clearing, because this will be on the high ground, forcing the Confederate forces to attack both in woods, which will work to our defensive advantage. And if they come up here through the clearing, they'll have to attack uphill. They're gonna give them a little bit of a line. The idea is to hold this with as few troops as possible. Now, if we spin over here to the north a little bit more, looking at Turner's Gap, the situation is a lot messier. Again, likewise, with Fox's Gap, we have a good number of Confederate reinforcements and strong forces pushing up this road, this main road into the gap to kind of hold it, perhaps even push the Northern forces off this. As quickly as possible, this is kind of a key turn, would like to see if the Northern forces could advance and take Turner's Gap right here. So the idea I think is to throw as many forces as we can straight up this hill. This is tough going. And it doesn't help that General Pleasanton was just wounded or killed, as the simulation might be, by a sharpshooter in the two o'clock turn before that. So they've lost their leader here. I'll sort that out. And they're attacking uphill against some pretty stiff defense here. So this is a tough ask, but we have troops coming up the valley here as well. There's more reinforcements on their way. So the idea, I think it's kind of two forces slamming into each other. And the other thing I'm thinking as the North is if we can slide some troops up this hill here, perhaps break through in this weak spot, or at least put some pressure on it before these reinforcements from the Confederate forces perhaps tighten up that gap in their lines. So lots of different ways that this can swing. Let's get started now with the rally phase. So how the rally phase works in the game basically is that troops have a maximum strength. And once they've been knocked down from that maximum strength by casualties in combat, they can never regain that full strength again. However, you can rally them up to one strength point less than their maximum in the rally phase, each one step each rally phase, each hour or so that would be. So if we look here right now, the only unit that this applies to is Nagel's infantry, who was badly uh, mauled in the last hour. Their current strength is two. If we look on the order of battle, their maximum strength is four. And so we can try to rally them to get them from a two to a three. Now there's no commander with them. If there, excuse me, if there were a commander with them, we would add that die roll modifier into this roll. But they're by themselves and they are not adjacent to enemy units. So in order for them to rally, they need to roll a five or a six. Let's see what happens here. They get a three. So they're gonna stay at that two strength points and they do not gain any strength in this rally phase. Now there's no routed units. There are conditions under which units can route in battle. 
and there's no other units that are below, that are two strength points or less below their maximum for the, two strength points or more below their maximum for the Northern forces. So we've completed the rally phase now. Now let's go talk about the movement phase. So let's talk about how we're going to try to handle Fox's gaps here for the north. The basic idea is that we're going to take uh, Gallagher's infantry here and brigade and try to run them up to this spot. We could push them all the way up further to this spot up here, but I don't think there's really much benefit to that for right now. So we're going to be a little bit cautious with their advance. We're trying to hold Fox's gap here with as few troops as possible. Now, how the movement works real quick. So we can do this actually for Gallagher's unit right here. It's a... Along a road, if a unit is in column formation, it is a half movement cost. All infantry units have four movement points per hour, per turn. So uh, if they, because they are in column form, they can move forward here. Now, also we should talk about facing as well. Facing the front of the unit is these two squares in front of them here. So you go side to side, this is the front, here is the side, and here is the rear. Units exert a zone of control around the front and the sides. And you move into one of your two front, front heckwards, keeping the same face facing. Each turn can change its facing twice during a movement turn. However, if it wants to do a third time, it can do it, but there's a one movement point penalty cost. So, and now there is no penalty for infantry units to go up a one level altitude change. So, Cavalry and artillery have that, so it would cost an extra movement point penalty for cavalry or artillery to go up here. Infantry, it does not. So because they're in column formation, I'm going to move them with my fingers. I think it's going to be a little bit easier. We can go a half right here. Then we're going to go up one again, so there's no penalty for that. That's one right there. I'm going to have them go straight ahead up to two right here and up to one and a half right here, sorry. And then we're going to have them shift out of column formation, which means they've used two and a half of their movement points. I think they're in good position right here to face any uh, Confederate reinforcements that try to come up over Lambert's clearing or perhaps even push through these woods to try to engage them. So Gallagher's force is in place. Now I'm gonna move some more forces around here. I'm also gonna try to bring up Let's actually do this right now. We're gonna switch around. Our lead brigade is the top brigade in a square. So we're gonna have Nagel's infantry reposition itself as the lead brigade. They were forced to, to drop out of that role due to the casualties. We're gonna move them straight ahead here. A unit can always move one hex, uh, despite um, regardless of movement costs, and it has enough to do this anyway. Going into woods adds a th uh, two movement points for enemy for infantry brigade, so this would be three movement points. That's fine for them right now. So we're going to try to try to attack this uh, Confederate artillery here that's holding the hilltop. We're going to move up some other heaps. We'll do this right now, and then we'll come back and take a look at Turner's Gap. All right, so we move Seymour's infantry up here just north of the clearing. So I think we've got a pretty good Union line here to take on these Confederate reinforcements that are making their way through the woods and along this road here. So we'll see if this is going to be enough to hold there. Let's now go take a look at another chunk of the battlefield. Let's actually look at some of our rear reinforcements. So just in the edge of the map here, we can see some more Union reinforcements. Here's Fox's Gap, where we're just moving Gallagher's infantry and such. So we're going to bring them up now into the valley. We'll move those forward and then show where they end up. All right, so other Union Fort reinforcements end up just in Fox's Gap. They should come into bear, uh, come into play in the next turn. This, by the way, is a uh, supposed to be a column marker, but I ran out of column markers. I've now got a couple freed up, so let's put the correct marker on Gibbons. Brigade here, we'll drop that down there, they're in column formation. Let's now take a look at Turner's Gap and see what we might want to try there. So the battle here at Turner's Gap, which is this square right, this hex right here, has really reached its peak intensity, peak intensity. And again, we have Confederate reinforcements pouring up from the rear right here that are going to be brought to bear on this point here. So this is really a big opportunity for the Union forces to try to push Hill off of Turner's Gap and see if they can get control of that second victory point locate, the second objective here. Our, our attack plans are really going to center on two things. I want to bring as much force to bear as possible on these two zones right here, Turner's Gap and the area right to the north of it. So we're going to try to bring more troops in here. I'm also going to pull Burnside and the, this replacement commander off because Pleasanton's been killed uh, because the Confederate forces have sharpshooters in here and they can take a pot shot at Burnside and probably have a pretty good chance at taking him out, which would be worth considerable victory points for them. 
So the rough plan is going to be to kind of rearrange a little bit in here. I also want to bring a good amount of force to bear on this artillery. Ideally, I'd like to knock this artillery out so the Union forces can start to encroach upon this hilltop here. Again, this is a high spot, high spots here. This is a low spot, a gap, but Confederate reinforcements, I think, are going to pour in here. It's going to be tough to take that, but it, it, at least something we want to try to force them to answer the question to. We also have, if we go a little bit further down the valley, we can see that we have some artillery coming to bear and more Union reinforcements along the roadway. So we're going to bring those up and start to bring those to bear in the battle now. I'm going to make that movement, and then we'll take a look and see what everything looks like once we get that done. All right, so now we've got our, our move. Our Union forces have moved. We're going to try to bring to bear some troops on this artillery. We've got some other troops facing uh, more to the west that are going to try to attack Hill's position here. And we've got, and, and just in terms of stacking limits, you can have three units and two commanders in any given hex. However, you can't have three infantry brigades in the same hex. So we've got two infantry brigades and there's artillery under that. Likewise, this is two infantry brigades and some artillery under that. This is all cavalry, which is fine going this way. Um, and actually, I think there might be some artillery there too. Yeah, there is. Robertson's artillery is there too. So it is now the end. We've also moved some of the re reinforcements that are coming in from the eastern side of the map. We moved those around a little bit, but those are a little bit more peripheral to the battle right now. So at this point in time, we've finished the Union's uh, main movement phase. Now it's time to deal with Union reinforcements. So the last batch of Union reinforcements are these three infantry brigades and this artillery that comes in here at uh, Hex 1417. Now the question is, do we want to send them towards Fox's Gap or Turner's Gap? And because Turner's Gap is so congested, I'm tempted, I think we're going to bring them up towards Fox's Gap. So I'm going to move them in and we'll see where they end up here as they uh, kind of finish their movement. So our re Union reinforcements, again, these are the final reinforcements of the battle for the Union forces. Uh, they took their uh, three o'clock turn here. They've moved up to Menser's Mill, which lies right over here. And they still have uh, probably a good hour and a half before two hours or so before they're going to reach the, the kind of have any kind of effectiveness in the, in the battle here. And that ends the Union reinforcement phase. Now it's time for the Union combat phase. So let's start with the Union combat. We're going to start from the southern part and work our way north. First, let's check out this assault on the Confederate artillery holding the hilltop here. Each combat phase has three parts to it. Each combat attack has three parts to it, if you would. Offensive artillery, defensive fire, and then the final assault phase. So we're going to start out with the Union artillery here. Now, to be clear, a couple things. I, I, I originally had Nagel's infantry and the artillery here. I changed that move to here because it's actually a better spot to attack from. So even though I, you know, I moved it and I probably shouldn't move it again, I'm kind of giving myself the liberty to, to correct little errors that I'm making as I'm playing the game right here. So Nagel's infantry and the artillery is here. Nagel's infantry is not going to be part of the assault. They would not be effective going uphill against this artillery because you lose one strength point for each elevation change and you lose one strength point for going uphill in general. So uh, for each X, so it would be down to zero. So they would have not, they're not effective against this artillery attack. So they're not going to be part of the offensive. The artillery, however, is going to fire suppression fire. So that's the Pennsylvania light. This artillery, the Ohio light is not going to fire. They would be ineffective as well with a suppression rating of one. Uh, by the way, just to clarify, there's two numbers for artillery. The first number is suppression. The second number is canister, canister when it's used against uh, infantry and assaulting. So this would have a suppression rating of one, but because they're firing uphill, they lose that one strength point, making it a zero. So they're not going to fire. So to clarify here, the only thing that's firing right now is this Union artillery with a suppression rating of two. Because they're firing uphill, they lose one strength point, so they have a rating of one. And the way that combat works is for each strength point, you get to roll one die, and you need a six to hit. And we'll talk a little bit about woods in a second. They fire, and they do not have any effect. So the initial Union artillery assault does not work as they're trying to take this hilltop. Even if they did roll a six here, a unit that's defending in woods for the very first six results you get, you get to re-roll it and they need a five or a six to hit. So even if that were a six, they would have needed another five or six to hit. So just not enough forces. It's really hard to take forces uphill that are dug into woods in this game. So now we're going to do the Confederate defensive fire. They could use their ranged fire to try to hit this artillery that fired upon them uh, from this edge, or 
they can use the canister fire to try to take on the infantry, even though they're firing out their side. So we're gonna do that, because we wanna see if we can hit this infantry coming up. So we're gonna use their canister firing rate, attack strength, which is a three. They're gonna fire on Ferrero's infantry brigade that is charging up the hill towards them. Because they're firing out their side, it is reduced by half down to one and a half and then rounded up, which is two. Now, I'm not quite sure, uh, I'm not 100% sure that I've got this part right because the rules say for this one, when you, you lump all of this canister fire and if there were infantry brigades here providing defensive fire into one number, and then you calculate that. Um, but for lower elevation, it says add one SP, one strength point to the total strength points for each hex during close combat. And I assume by during close combat that it means uh, the defensive fire as well. So we would go from uh, three to one and a half, rounded to two. Because they're firing downhill, it's gonna be rounded up to three. So the Confederate artillery will get three dice rolls on the assaulting infantry. Let's see if they get any luck. They do not, one, a four, and a one means their defensive fire has no impact. Now let's calculate the Union attack. So the Union attack here, Ferrero's infantry has a brigade as a strength of four, Crook's infantry brigade has a strength of three. That gives them a total of seven. However, this is where it gets nasty. They're going uphill and there is a two elevation change, 200 feet higher that they're charging up. So this is a very steep hillside they're trying to make their assault on. You reduce, the SPs from each hex by one, so that takes the total down from seven down to six, and you further reduce that by an additional one for each change in elevation, which means that we reduce it by two more. So the total of seven immediately gets cut down to four, and that's the infantry strength that hits the hilltop. Let's see if they can take this artillery out with an attack of four here. They get a three, a four, a five, and a six. So they get one hit. However, the defender is in woods. So we have to re-roll that six, see if we get a five or a six. We do not. The Confederate artillery has held in the face of this onslaught. They've got, I mean, a really tough defensive position here on the top of the hill. Union forces fail to take it. Let's come over here now and try the Union assault on Pelham's artillery here holding this ridge line. Again, Union forces going uphill into the woods. We have one Union artillery unit here, which is the Kentucky Light. They have an attack strength of one. However, we know that's not going to be effective, so they're just not going to fire and not participate in the attack. Pelham's artillery is going to use its canister to fire defensively. And this one as well, actually Scammon has to go up. It's gonna lose one from the hex and one uphill. So they're not gonna even assault altogether. We really need more forces there. Union's gonna have Phelps and then Doubleday that could show up to perhaps and strengthen this. So we got more reinforcements on the way, but right now there's not enough force for them to really even bother attacking. So it's all gonna come down to Harlan's infantry brigade going uphill. Pelham's gonna fire at that. They have one shot. They need a firing canister fire. It's downhill, however, so we add one to it giving them two dice rolls to hit Harlan's infantry as it comes up. They get double ones, which is about as far away from a six as you can possibly get. Some terrible artillery firing by Pelham's artillery here. I should say too, they initially were up at Fox's Gap and they got routed, pushed back down here. General Hill came over them and rallied them. Pelham's artillery's had a pretty horrendous battle so far. Now we go to Harlan's attack force. We have an attack strength of five. However, as we've seen before, it gets reduced by one because they're going uphill for the whole hex. And we have to reduce it a further one by each strength level difference. So it goes down from a five to a four from the minus one to the hex and minus one more for the elevation difference, giving them three attack shots here against the artillery. They get a one, a three, and a four. Harlan's, Harlan's infantry brigade does not successfully root out Pelham's artillery and they have held one of the first good things that's held onto them all day. So Confederate forces, despite being relatively weak, have held their, for have held their positions right now. Now let's go to our next Union attack. For the sake of clarity, I'm gonna move Harland over here and then just remember that we're gonna bring them back. This is everything going straight here uphill against hills uh, General Hill's infantry here. There's a good Confederate strength force here 
This would be a big one. Want to see if they can push them out of Turner's Gap. This is the battle for the victory point hex. Let's see what we've got for Union artillery to bear. We have the Massachusetts Light and the second US. They've got an attack strength of two. There is artillery involved, so by rule, they have to target this uh, defensive artillery here that the Confederates have, Jones's artillery. So we're gonna get that. I believe there's another artillery here. It is two, it's attack strength of three. Everyone's going to attack. So we're gonna get all of this artillery firing suppression fire first. So let's calculate that. We have a two firing suppression fire from that hex and then a three firing suppression fire from this hex. However, we know that each artillery brigade loses one strength point when firing uphill. So this goes down to a one and this goes down to a two. So we have three artillery strength points in total firing on the Union, on the Confederate artillery defending Turner's Gap. So let's make those three rolls and see what happens. A three, a four, and a four. We're not seeing very good shooting by anyone yet. I think we've done a ton of rolls and we've only had one hit. Now, the Confederate forces here have a chance for defensive fire. I think we're going to, rather than concentrate on the artillery, we're gonna have the Confederate artillery combine forces with the infantry to give us a stronger Confederate, actually, no, we're not, because they're firing downhill, so they're gonna get a bonus anyway. So let's have Jones's artillery here target the Pennsylvania, the US artillery right here. So they're gonna fire suppression fire at this one, giving them one die roll, and they need a six to reduce that artillery by one. Just one die roll for suppression fire. Oh, they fire well. Jones's artillery hits, taking the US artillery down one strength point. We're gonna flip that unit over. They have been reduced. So a first taste of effective fire here, and that is the suppression fire for the artillery. Now we're going to have the defensive fire for the, Union, the Confederate forces before the assault. All right, so the Confederate forces here have Rhodes Infantry Brigade with a strength of three, and Kemper's Infantry Brigade with a strength of five. They will fire, and pardon if I've got my, I kind of calculate my pronunciation here. They have a total strength of eight. They are firing at this lead attack here, which I assume is pronounced Christ and not Christ. Apologies if I've got that pronunciation incorrect. We're gonna go with Christ. They are firing downhill to eight, and we add one SP to the total of each hex during close combat. So a strength of eight turns into a strength of nine. This is some murderous defensive fire, potentially, by the Confederate forces. We're gonna throw nine of the 10 potential dice. And in any attack, the maximum number of dice you can throw is 10. So we've got nine here right now. Let's see what happens to the Union forces as they try to get Turner's Gap. Oh, a brutal two sixes. That takes Christ's force and routes them down to a two. So let's replace them with their defensive replacement here. Murderous, murderous infantry fire, kind of just basically kind of tearing apart this assault here. So Chris falls down to a two, and now we have to see if they rout. All right, so Chris's infantry here has suffered a two-step loss, so they immediately must make a morale check. And if they fail, this entire hex's assault fails, and they have to retreat. In order to succeed on their morale check, they do not have a commander in there influencing it because we moved Burnside out because I didn't want him to suffer a casualty. So that means that they need to roll a five or a six to succeed. They get a six, they succeed. And despite the murderous fire, the offensive assault continues. All right, so Chris's brigade here has suffered uh, two step point losses. So they are immediately moved to the bottom of the stack and the new lead brigade is Welsh's infantry brigade that takes charge of the assault here. Now, just kind of one point here on the rules. What, I, what I'm not sure yet, we have a, a rather broad two hex assault on here, and the rules say that if this hex were to, if that, if Chris were to fail their morale check, they would have had to retreat and the assault fails. But what happens in a multi-hex one? I assume the other units would still carry on, but I'm not quite sure the rule isn't I don't quite, I'm assuming it carries on, but I'm not sure if the entire assault fails, if one hex come, comes under fire that forces it to retreat, 
or the assault continues. So I'm not sure, but that didn't happen because they held on, so we won't worry about it now. So the defensive fire, rather murderous. Now we continue the assault here. It's the Union forces turn to go. We have Fairchild's infantry brigade with the strength of three, Welsh with a two, and Chris now reduced, uh, Welsh with a four, and Chris reduced to a two. So we have six and three is nine. However, we're going uphill. So Fairchild loses one strength point for going uphill down to a two and one for the hundred foot difference going down to a one. So that brings the Union from Fairchild's infantry brigade down to one. Welsh and Christa are at six. They lose likewise two more, so they're down to four. So we have five dice for the Union assault here. Still a fairly strong assault and they are going after Kemper's brigade, which is the lead brigade here. Let's see if the Union can extract retribution here. They get a six, so they whittle away the Union, the, the Confederate forces, but not enough to force a morale check, and the Union, for the Confederate forces again hold Turner's gap despite the ferocious Union assault up the hill. All right, the last Union attack here is the cavalry charge here on General Hood holding the spot just to the north of Turner's Gap. The Union forces have artillery, Robertson's artillery here. There's no artillery in the Confederate defensive square here. So this artillery here, Robertson's artillery, can use their canister fire and fire at the top infantry brigade, the lead brigade here, which is Walker's sharpshooters, which were responsible for killing General Pleasanton in the hour preceding. So they get three. It is on flat terrain with no hill modifiers or anything and no woods modifiers. So a straight, rather deadly, three shots with canister fire. Let's see how this starts out. A one, two, and a three. Robertson's artillery is completely ineffective here. Now defensive fire goes next. General Hood move out of the way for just a second. Oh, we gotta bring Harland back over here. Put that there. Walker and Anderson firing with a strength of nine. This is rather brutal here, coming right on the cavalry charge by, Gen by Farnsworth. Strength of nine, there's no modifiers because it's level ground. So we're just gonna get a massive defensive infantry shot, f shot here. Nine dice, let's see what happens to Farnsworth cavalry charge. Got one more coming down. Oh my goodness, three sixes. The maximum that a unit can suffer in losses in one charge is two. So Farnsworth cavalry goes from a five down to a three. Rather devastating loss there and we know now that they have to immediately make a roll here. Now, that defensive fire, if there were two ones in that, the sharpshooters would have hit this leader, but they did not. So the sharpshooters are not, they did not take anybody out there. However, they must make a morale check to see if the assault continues. If not, they're going to have to retreat. Normally they need a five or a six. However, our replacement commander adds one. They need a four, five, or a six. They get a two, they fail their morale check, and they must retreat. All right, so they would overstack if they went here. We're going to send Robertson and Farnsworth here, as well as the replacement commander, and then Whiting will retreat to this spot. So I think by, I'm not quite sure what the facing rules are for retreat, but because it says under routing, if they had gotten four sixes, the unit would have been completely routed, but they got three. If that had happened, they would have had to turn around and face the other way. So I assume because this is a retreat, they can stay the same way. Now, the defender does not occupy this hex in case of a failed assault, but that brings us to the end of the Union 3 p.m. turn. Nothing doing for the Union forces. Some minor casualties inflicted upon the Confederate forces, but Confederates hold to the north of Fox's Gap and once again hold Turner's Gap with no ground gained by Union of forces except for some pretty devastating casualties. Now let's go to, that finishes up the last part of the Union phase, let's go to the Confederate phase. All right, so let's start the Confederates 3 p.m. turn. We're gonna start with their rally phase. The only unit that is two strength points or less below maximum is Ripley's Infantry Brigade here, which we'll talk about why it's facing that way and why it's here. They need a roll of a five or a six to uh, rally, and so that would add Get them back, they get a four, they do not, so they stay at a strength of two. So now it's time for the Confederate forces to move. And we have to talk a little bit about a special rule in the game to talk about how we're going to handle this. But I think our rough plan of action here for the Confederate forces is given especially the failure here since that, we're going to probably, 
I'm going to try to switch, maybe switch out some of these infantry units in here to maybe switch some of these infantry units in here to compensate for some of the losses that have happened or maybe strengthen these positions here. I'd like to see if we can bring some forces here to maybe bring some, some offensive kind of bearing against these units coming at the Confederate forces from this side. And then we definitely need to bring a bulk of troops up here to counter this to see if we can start to push back here because if the Confederates want to win outright, we have to get them all the way over here to Fox's Gap, which is a tall order considering there's, well, there's six hours left, but the last two are the dusk turns and those have uh, weakened combat effectiveness. So uh, lots of things for the Confederates to do, but let's first talk about one special rule that in, is in the game here. Um, after, once Fox's Gap falls in the game, the Union forces can evacuate, can, well, can push cavalry units off this western edge of the map. And the Confederate forces have to match those units in strength points. So once Fox's Gap, we moved a conf uh, Union infantry off the board here, and we got Gregg's infantry off there for four points. That gives the Unions an immediate one victory point for doing that, and the Confederates have to match them with points. Now, at the time, the rules say you have to move a unit units within seven hexes of this square that they exited from, which is right here off the edge of the map. At that point, it was this unit here and Ripley's infantry. We tried to move them back as best we could, and then subsequently, these reinforcements came in. Now, one thing I'm not quite sure, and the, the rules don't really clarify it, is to whether the units that have already been designated for retreat have to continue being the ones that you've selected, or because reinforcements have come in, we can then shift them to being the ones that have to be evacuated from the map instead, have to kind of compensate for that four strength points of our cavalry that have left. I'm going to go with we can switch the units up because I think that makes the most logical sense. Uh, so we're going to bring Ripley's forces basically back into combat, bring this infantry here, not Jones's infantry, but Garland's infantry, back up into action. And instead, we're going to send probably Drayton's four strength points of infantry right back off the board, and that will compensate for the four strength points of uh, cavalry that the Union have um, uh, kind of moved off to the off the western edge of the map here. Now, thinking about that too, what I should have done as the Union forces is they have a number of one strength point cavalry units, this one right here, and then there's another one underneath Farnsworth attack here. I should have moved those over to Fox's Gap with the idea of sliding them off because they're only one strength point. They don't really do very much, but if we can escape them off that edge, they'd be worth one victory point each. So we really should have three victory points as the Union forces, but that's something kind of a lesson learned type of thing. So anyway, uh, enough of the babbling. It's time to move the Confederate forces. I'm going to go ahead and try to shift units up. We're going to kind of play with the movement here, and then we'll see what it looks like when everything is done. All right, so here's the picture of the Confederate forces after their movement at 3 p.m. We've shifted a number of infantry units over here. We couldn't quite get in a position to try to attack these units, but I think we probably can maybe next turn. We'll have to see what the Union forces do. I brought another infantry unit down this little trail here to try to get some defensive help to our hilltop here. We we're able to move up some Confederate infantry to help shore up this hilltop defense here because we really need this point to hold. If this were to cap to fall, it's going to be allow the Union forces to really start to bring some pressure on our flank here to the south side of Turner's Gap. So we really want to try to hold this line. That was a big part of our movement. Uh, we moved also kind of moving over here. I moved Drayton's infantry off to compensate for Greg's cavalry that's moved off. So that takes care of that issue there. Then down towards Turner's Gap, as we look at this, Got some artillery I want to try to eventually bring up here. We brought some infantry up in here. Um, did be Colquitt's infantry here, which is going to put a little bit more pressure if we want to try to kind of fold back this Union flank here if we might. Now, they do not have to attack. You have to attack if you're at the same elevation level. Uh, you do not have to attack if you're at a le lower elevation level. And furthermore, cavalry can't attack into woods. So they, are, uh, they don't have to worry about the cavalry attacking Colquitt's infantry here. Um, we did bring some units to shore up the infantry in here, basically just trying to strengthen this line here to see if we can hold this and then perhaps pick up a win on victory points for the Confederates. Further to the north, we took Ripley's infantry, which was up over here, moved them here because these sneaky Union forces, who's ever doing them, are trying to sneak 
and Infantry Brigade Magleton's in Magleton, perhaps pronunciation, apologies, uh, Magleton's Infantry Brigade here. They're trying to slide them around the Confederate flank. So I feel like Ripley's force, which has already been somewhat depleted, should be able to take up a position in these woods and perhaps hold them off from being able to get behind our flank there. So that's been the Confederate movement here in the 3 p.m. turn. Now let's go to the reinforcements phase, which brings us to an interesting story. All right, so I'm gonna, I'll mention this furthermore in my full review of the game, but we have a fairly significant, so let's take a look at it. We have a fairly significant amount of Confederate reinforcements that uh, show up here at the 3 p.m. turn. Now, considering again, this is, the, this is the back half of the battle and we have really four turns, five turns of daylight, four turns of daylight after this one. So it's, you know, a chunk of the battle's already happened here. But the problem with this uh, batch of Confederate reinforcements is that they historically, they were not at the battle. And it represents roughly about 25% of the Confederate forces here. So this is an issue that the developer and the designer are kind of working on for a fix because I think that, you know, the, the game is pretty balanced as it is right now. So they're working to address this and it's gonna be interesting. I'm interested to see how they finally resolve this issue. For the moment though, I'm more interested in the flow of gameplay and the balance of the scenario the way it is. With the understanding that historically this wasn't the case, I'm still going to bring them in and play the game as it's originally designed. So we're gonna move these Confederate forces in and continue our rough plan again of sending some of these to Fox's Gap, perhaps keeping a couple in reserve in here to fill holes in Turner's Gap. We might send another unit over here to help Ripley uh, kind of contest with that stronger infantry brigade that's coming in. And we've got some artillery as well that we might try to slide over to Fox's Gap. I think the big thing is gonna see if we can have the Confederate forces hold Turner's Gap and then launch a final assault on Fox's Gap. But there's a lot of fighting to happen between now and then. So we'll get these Confederate forces into the battlefield and see what it looks like after that. All right, so we've moved the Confederate forces in, basically scattering them around with the intents of kind of pulling some forces up on the flanks here of the Confederate sides, uh, bringing some more troops over towards Fox's Gap, and then bringing some artillery that I think we're gonna try to slide down to that gap, if you would, between Fox's Gap and uh, Turner's Gap to see if we can somehow get some Confederate push down this hillside here, which might kind of change the nature of the battle. So that's the rough movement that the Confederate reinforces take at 3 p.m. Now it's time for the Confederate attacks. So the battle is getting pretty intense now. This is everything on the board. All the forces are here. It, the battle is really reaching its kind of crescendo, if you would. No real attacks up here that are possible for the Confederate forces. We could have these Confederates defending the top of the hill, attack downhill, perhaps it niggles, but it's in woods, it's downhill, and I don't want to reduce their defensive strength. I think the situation is going to be to try to have this just stay as strong as they can to anchor the line. So we're gonna have the Confederate forces here just try to hold and, and not attack. However, we do have one point of power that I think we can take advantage of. Because again, the rules are you, you, you have to attack at the same altitude. You don't have to attack downhill. So there's no places now, because the Confederate forces pushed back this Union attack, they don't have to attack this way. They don't have to attack any of these places. They're all downhill. So they could be content to just sit here and let the Union forces kind of throw themselves uphill at them. However, we do have a nice, juicy potential counterattack on these depleted Union forces that just charged up the hill that tried to take uh, Turner's Gap there. So I think we're going to try to take advantage of that and push the advantage. Attacking downhill, we should be able to play, land some pretty murderous fire, and the Union forces have been weakened. So we're going to counterattack here. We're going to have the Confederate forces from Turner's Gap and to the right of Turner, to the north of Turner's Gap, attack these Union forces here downhill. So let's calculate that battle. The first thing that we have to do is to calculate the suppression fire because there is Union artillery in that defensive hex. So our offensive, the Confederate offensive artillery has to fire at that. It's got a strength of two right now. And then it's also got some artillery in here at a strength of one. So a total suppression fire of three. It has to fire at the artillery down here. There is no forest there. It's firing downhill, but for suppression fire, that doesn't add a bonus. It just makes the range four instead of three, which doesn't apply here. So we get three dice rolls to see if the Confederate artillery can take out some of the Union artillery. They get a one, a two, and a four. No luck. So the Union artillery suffers no damage. Now it's time for the Union artillery, Unions to fire defensive fire. 
Yeah, so defensive fire has the option here of combining with the infantry fire to provide canister fire and hit the attacking uh, units. That's what it's going to do, because it's going to be actually a pretty effective defensive turn here. Welsh and Crist are going to join with the artillery, which is three, four, five, and four is nine total strength points. However, we know that because they're firing uphill, we subtract one from the hex and we subtract one from every elevation change. So it goes from a nine down to a seven, still, yeah, six, seven, eight, nine, down to a seven, still pretty deadly here. And they are going to fire at walkers attacking sharpshooters here, because that's a pretty valuable Confederate unit there. So yeah, this is actually turning out to be a little bit bloodier than I perhaps thought. This is pretty good defensive fire. Might be a mistake here for the Confederate forces to attack. But nevertheless, here we go, down the hill. Uh, seven defensive firing for the Union. Oh my goodness, that's terrible. They get one, 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 two, two. That's just horrendous fire. They must be really rattled from their last attack. No casualties for the Union, for the Confederate attack forces here. That's pretty impressive. So um, if we leave that out of the way, now the Confederates get payback here. This is going to be somewhat interesting. So Confederate attack forces, we can add up all these points. We get five and four is nine and four is 13 and three is 12. It's basically like 700 strength points, which basically means, and they get the bonus for going downhill. So we get to roll all 10 dice because it's a maximum of 10 dice. And they're going straight into the teeth of Welsh's infantry brigade, rolling 10 dice on the attack. Ooh, they get two sixes. That's gonna hurt. So Welsh's defenders here lose two steps. A very successful Confederate attack here. Let's get them replaced with their lower strength unit. And I believe now we have to check to see if they are forced to retreat. All right, so first we have to see if the Union forces retreat. They have to survive that five or six they need to stay in place. They get a four. They are forced to retreat. Again, I'm not quite sure how the facing works on this one. We're gonna pull them down here under McClellan in here and push them right back here and assume that it is an orderly retreat because they weren't routed. So we will leave them with the commanders here. Now by rule, the, the Confederate forces have to occupy this hex. All right, so the rules say it has to be an infantry or cavalry brigade and it only has to be one infantry brigade. So yeah, as I was assuming, leaders don't have to do that. I'm, I'm a little concerned that they're not gonna be able to hold this as much as I kind of like some of the angles we've got here and some of the pressure it puts on this unit in Union Infantry here. Um, yeah, I'm a little concerned that they're gonna get, have a, have a tough time there. We're gonna send uh, Anderson's Infantry up there and I'm gonna hold back with everything else. If anything, this buys us, I think, some time here uh, to allow, and we'll come right for that'll give us some forward facing. We can always move up to assault the next turn and this will make it, they'll have to come uphill Gap gives us a little bit more of a buffer. So we'll send them up in their advance and we have taken some ground, pushed the Union forces a little bit back from Turner's Gap here, although they still have a little bulge here that can go forward, but maybe next turn the Confederate forces could really have a chance to push this back. But then again, we've got more Union infantry coming up. The battle has really reached its peak here. And that brings us to the final Confederate attack in this turn and it brings us to the end of the 3 p.m. turn. So now what would happen going forward is there are four more turns of daylight. All of the units are on the, all of the contestants and combatants are on the battlefield. So we would continue going on like this for four more turns. Then we have two dusk game turns where the combat effectiveness deteriorates a little bit. So still a good, you know, third or more of the battle uh, left to go here. And it's really reached its peak. But I'm hopeful this gives you a sense for how the game plays. And again, you can kind of see, we talked a little bit about the issue with the order of battle. We've got, you know, there's some places where I talked a little bit about some of the uncertainties I've got with the rules. And I wouldn't be surprised um, if I've made a few errors in combat execution and movement execution here too. So, uh, but, but again, that's not necessarily the main point of this at this time, because I think the rules are going to be fleshed out a little bit going forward. And there's still going to be the clarification made to how they're going to compensate for 
the um, order of battle uh, extras here that the Confederate forces have, and that's going to require a little bit of a change to the game. But the main idea behind this is to give you a sense for the game system and for how it plays. I'm going to come back in a couple days with a full review that talks about my feelings on how it plays and how it flows and some of the thoughts on the rules, some of the thoughts on the order of battle. So I'll be back in a couple of days with that. Let me know if you have any questions down below. Thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed this combat play. You may also enjoy us when we take a look at some of the game flow and rules for Captain C, which is a frigate to frigate combat game also published by Legion War Games. I'll put a link to that right up here. And thanks again for watching. Have a great day, everybody.